Pepsi's uh, away. As I said, Sunday school hour up in uh, the Louisville area preaching. And so trust in God and bless. Now they may be going to lunch up there because they're our head of us. So they may be getting ready, they may be getting ready to eat. But uh, anyway, that God will be with them. It's good to see the Huffman family here this morning. I've known these people for a few years now. And I certainly appreciate this family and mean that. So, uh, anyway, I saw the vehicle coming in with a boat behind it. I thought, well, and somebody said, that's, that's Brother Huffman and his family. So, thank God for it. I don't know if they're catching any fish, but we uh, enjoy seeing them again and fellowship with them. You all live in West Virginia now, is that right? Ohio. Ohio, you still in Ohio. I knew that's where you got, I thought that your earth was. My brother lives in West Virginia. Oh, he's eating one. I got that mixed up. Yeah, I know, know them too. But Ohio. That's... All right, this morning we want to uh, uh, speak to you, Lord, helping us uh, out of First Thessalonians. Chapter 1, if you want to turn there and find it, we'll look at some stuff. A few minutes and try to preach. Now I can't, uh, I can't make that circle around here like Brother Larry does. It takes me too long to get up there and take more steps. So. I used to do that. I used to be about as active as my knees and all that doesn't allow me to do that anymore. So I don't try to pull it but I stay there. But anyway, we thank the Lord for the blessings for the last year that we've been able to attend services here in the home. The Lord willing, we'll catch our flight next Saturday uh, at Nashville and fly to LA. And from LA to Shanghai, China. Now, I've never been on that way. Although we always went through Korea or Japan or, uh, or <coughs> Taiwan. Been through all of those making trips. But a lot of, of uh, a lot of us going through China now. And uh, so it'll be a different uh, trip in that way. It won't be no shorter. From LA to Shang Shanghai, China is, is uh, 14 hours. That's a long time to be on a, be on a plane, yeah. but uh, over 30 hours when we take the airport time. Now, but, uh, I don't know any better way to do it now. If you catch a boat, I don't know how long it takes to get there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thank God for finally saying it. Guys, sometime a year or so ago, our insurance is de developing a, a plane that it would eventually be used for a Passing the planes, and I forget how, how quick that uh, you could go somewhere that time. But I don't know whether I want that or not. But, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm looking for the trip to heaven. We won't need any tickets or passports or anything else. That, that's already paid for. But uh, appreciate the prayers. I, we've enjoyed this year being here, being able to fellowship with our sending church. And uh, so. Uh, this will be, I guess, our last Sunday, Lord willing. We'll probably be here Wednesday night. And then. They start talking back to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see. <laughs> so, all right. And I do want to comment on that. The song that Adam sung, I like that. He, he did a great job on it. Yeah, yeah. Really did. That was, that was a blessing. <coughs> All right, First Thessalonians chapter 1. And I'm not going to read all of it right now. I'll refer to some more, but I want to use the fourth verse. And I want to pose a question and then see if I can answer it. It's uh, interesting. Bible here, Paul said to this church, he said, Knowing brethren, beloved, your election of God. And so many people say, Well, you can't know who the elect are. Well, Paul knew who these were. And I want to this morning, if we can, to answer the question of the Bible, how he knew. And 
because definitely we you can't just look out at people and say this and this and that is not until something takes place and I hope when I get done with it maybe it will be a little clearer to you and to me both let us pray our Father we do pray this morning that you would speak speak to our hearts and Lord that your presence would be real it's not anything Lord that's better than thy presence so Lord I pray you'd be with us grant to the and I know Lord no doubt even in a congregation of this size there's some here this morning that have never made your calling and election sure. We pray this morning that through the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, you'd reveal yourself to any that's here this morning that don't know you. I pray that you would. And I pray you'll get glory out of this uh, service to thy wonderful name. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in this, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. But let me say this. Paul wasn't uh, saying this to, to this church, uh, in other words, to uh, brag on them or anything like that. If you don't, uh, uh, for instance, uh, he didn't do that to all churches that he wrote to. He wrote to the churches in Galatia, and he said in uh, Galatians 4 and verse 19, he said, uh, I stand in doubt of you. That's quite a contrast, wasn't it? But yet he had priests in Galatia. Now why would they have said that? Well, it's easy to see why he said that to them because they were so enamored with false teachers. And uh, they wanted to turn back to the law and to uh, get under the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law was good for what it was given for, but it never was given to save you. And uh, they wanted to mix it up and say, well, you got to have law and grace. Well, they just don't mix. You either have law or you have grace, one of the two. You're either trying to make it to heaven by your own works or you either trust in Jesus Christ. That's all there is to it. So Paul said to them, he said, I stand in doubt of you. In other words, uh, whether you really are what you uh, think you are. And then he said to the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he said, examine yourselves, whether you be in faith or not. Prove your own self. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. So Paul wasn't using flattering language here to this church without good reason. And so he makes a, an emphatic statement there that uh, knowing, he said, not wondering about it, knowing, but your beloved brethren, your election of God. Now, a lot of people today are, that's against election or against the uh, uh, the sovereignty of God, they say, well, uh, you can't know who they are. Well, I agree with you to a point. And so when I preach, I mean, I preach to everybody. I, I don't think there's a soul anywhere that's not, it's not a wrong, it would be wrong to preach to. I, 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 believe, I believe we were to preach to every creature we can. But on the other hand, when I'm telling to them, I don't know. But now if God is pleased to regenerate them, then it will be. It'll be evident. And so uh, here he says that now in Philippians, the book of Philippians, Paul said to them in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, he that has begun a good work in you will uh, perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now Paul, was, that church he was sure about they, that they had the right thing. Now why? Let me call your attention to Scripture. You don't have to turn it more to, but in, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, and uh, verse number 33. And uh, the Lord Jesus, no doubt, was teaching here in parables. But he said, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. Now notice this. For the tree is known by its fruit. So how did Paul know about this Thessalonican church like this and he could say that so boldly and confident? I'll tell you how he did. If you look at a verse or two with me, you'll see. Here he says in verse number three, he said, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love and your patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now how did he know? Because they were bearing fruit that testified to the fact they belonged to God. Right. 
And so Paul could look at their fruit there. And you notice what he said. He said, uh, uh, he said, I, I cease not without ceasing uh, your, to remember your work of faith. In other words, they had a faith that worked. And so many uh, today, and I'm, again, I'm not trying to judge or anybody, but often seem like their faith never moves them to do anything. Something wrong with that. James said in James chapter 4, he said that's dead faith. Dead, a faith that produces no works is dead faith. And so we need to be careful about that. And so here, uh, because their faith was active and working, Paul could say to them, I know, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now, faith that works is the faith, in fact, Titus 1-2, it calls it the faith of God's elect. In other words, it's living faith. It's the gift of God. Ephesians, we like to quote it. And about, a lot of people do that. I wonder if they really believe it. But it says that uh, in Ephesians that faith is the gift of God. If we have real faith, God gave it to us. And how does He give it to us? He gives it to us in regeneration. We're dead in sins and trespasses. And God comes and makes us alive or uh, performs a new birth. He has to do it. I mean, some of these schemes they've got today to get, to get professions, they teach people they can regenerate themselves when you can't do it. Right. I've asked, I have one fellow I'll never forget him because he was, a, he was a medical doctor and also a missionary. And he was so upset because uh, he had heard somebody say that, uh, uh, that uh, regeneration come before faith. It's absolutely the truth. God don't regenerate you. He sure doesn't give you faith. So if you have faith in faith, you got that from God. And you got it through regeneration. He made you alive. Brought you out of the grave of sins and trespasses. And then when you're alive, you're born again, you're going to begin to produce some fruit. And when you begin to produce fruit, then people can look at it and say, well, that's a good tree. In other words, now that they have all the... the Things are blooming, you know. So it, it's pretty difficult sometimes for me, especially in, in Thailand, to know which which uh, a tree is which. And I'll tell you what, when they when they begin to put forth fruit, you can tell. I love I love to eat ripe yellow mangoes. They're really, really good. <laughs> All diabetics don't eat a lot of that. <laughs> Real sweet. But uh, you know, I wouldn't know I wouldn't know a mango tree just to walk up to one that wouldn't any fruit on. I might think it's an orange tree or something, you know, but it's not. So here it's a practical thing, and Jesus said that by the fruit of a tree you know what it is. In other words, if I walk up to a tree and it's it producing apples, I get the idea pretty quick that's an apple tree. If it's a peach tree, you go with their fruit. And he's saying among God's people. To, to be able to know anything about them is that you got to look at your fruit. Be around it. For a while, and I believe that. And I think we're probably only more careful with it this uh, day and time. And another thing he said here, he said, a labor of love. In other words, they, they love to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. They love it. And sometimes we look like what, what we got to do, you know, we got raised on dill pickles or uh, crab apples or something. No, we ought, to be, we ought to rejoice that God has chosen us and given us a job to do. Yeah. Uh. Doesn't bother me a bit in the world to go back to Thailand. I heard of there again. I wanted to stay at home and told wood because I when I come. But that just hasn't worked that way. And you can always be assured when, when there's something comes up before you and stops you from doing something, you better not try to kick that door down. You better just listen and make whatever turn that God had you to. But some people say, oh, you're over there and you're so old, you ought to be at home. No, that's, that, that, if that's God's will, that's like the poor old me. And to be anywhere else and try to stay, it's going to get you in trouble. So, no, it doesn't all. I'm glad that God still got something for me to do, and I am convinced He has. 
And I'm going to I'm going to try to work on the language uh, uh, more seriously than I have the years before. And I hope to get to the place where I'm at least conversational. And I, I know a lot of words now, but I can't put them all together. In that, uh, but we're, I'm going to start, I hope to start an intense study with uh, maybe her nephew or someone that can help me out uh, with that. We helped him get through school, get an education, so now maybe get a He'll, he'll help me out and learn more uh, <coughs> Thai language and be able, and so pray for that. You see, at my age, you're not expected to learn languages. And, uh, I don't know, I, but I believe the Lord's going to help me to at least get to where I can, I, I can con be conversational with, with them. Now then, notice here, and then he says this, he said, uh, patience of hope. You know, patience is a real virtue, real, yeah. and I'm short on it. But I'll tell you something, through God's chastening, what am I, I'm, I'm a lot better at it now than I used to be. You know, I, it used to be like they said about one person, I want patience and give it to me right now. Mm -hmm. Well, that ain't the way God gives it to me. The Bible said tribulation work of patience. Mm -hmm. Patience holds now, I don't know about you, but I, I just, I'm just confessing this morning that I've had trouble with patience. Still have it sometimes, but I don't. See, but here it said that they were patient. In fact, it says in, in uh, verse number 9, he's talking about this, and we'll do a little more work on this in a few moments, but it said, They themselves showed of us what manner of entering in we had of you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. Yes, we're waiting on the, we're waiting on the uh, uh, return of the Lord Jesus Christ to get us. I believe in pre-tribulation. I have ever since I've been saved and still do. But anyway, we're, we're not to we're not to go out here and become moon gazers or something. Uh, we we ought to be busy, but we ought to be patient and waiting on it. You know, Paul said it would be. He said it would be better for me to part this body and go go be with the Lord. He said that's far better. But he said I I, I choose not. I'm in a straight between two. In other words, if it's expedient for me to stay here and to preach to you and help you along, I'm willing to do that. And that's the kind of that's the kind of patience evidently these Thessalonians had learned. And you notice that in this, if you study uh, First and Second Thessalonians, that they had a lot of they had a lot of persecution against them. Now I want you to notice too. The Bible said in verse five, this is important: for our gospel came not to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, in much assurance. As you know what matter me and we were among you. Now notice they had they had a they had a real experience with God. This thing today, uh, it's been going on. I, I've cried out against it many times in fellowship meetings and gotten all kinds of problems. But you notice he said here, he said, Our gospel came not to you in word only. Most witnessing is nothing in the world but sacredship. If I get you to pray this prayer, you'll be all right. No, you won't. I tried that. Listen, they had experienced the work of the Holy Ghost in their heart. As a result of that, they had proper fruit in that, that the Bible said they turned to God from idols. That's repentance. They turned from the idols that they had known to worship, and they had turned to the true and living God. <coughs> And then he goes on and said to wait for his son from heaven. That's faith. And all of that is a fruit of regeneration or the new birth. And so therefore, uh, they had a proper experience. Used to, you couldn't get you couldn't get in a Baptist church if you couldn't give a credible experience. They, they expected you to be able to give a credible experience. And this stuff, you know, well, I received Jesus. That's good, but did Jesus receive you? 
That's 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 what makes it makes it real. But here, you know, I like that. I, uh, for our gospel came not to you in word only. A lot of gospels in word only. Now the word is necessary, but it's the Holy Spirit to give life. He generates. He he germinates because that word to his seed to germinate in your heart and bring forth a new birth. In other words, the efficient cause of it is the Holy Ghost. But uh, he never does it without hearing. I don't believe anyone's ever been saved without hearing. <coughs> now, primitive Baptists do. They teach that, you know, you might be saved and never know it till you get to heaven. Problem is, you're not going to get to heaven like that. That's a deception. In other words, that's, that would be a word only. And our neighbors all around us here that believe in baptismal regeneration, that's exactly what they believe. They say all you have is what's between your ears. I didn't, I didn't tell me that. You talk about you talk about the Holy Spirit and they make fun of you. I, I, I wouldn't want to be in that shape because it's very close to, to blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But it's but here he said that that their experience was generated by the Holy Ghost. Our gospel came not to you in word only, but it also uh, in in the Holy Ghost uh, uh, here uh, came unto you in the word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. There's two elements I believe in the new birth. One of them is the Word of God, and the other is the Spirit. And they both must be. And one of the things that's missing in our churches uh, so bad, I, I have conversations with a lot of people about this, is that uh, uh, the Spirit of God is not working. In fact, He's ignored. They go to have a meeting, something that we do everything except what the Bible prescribes fasting and prayer. We've got to get. We've got to get our hearts. Uh, we got to yield to God that God works in us. I remember when I the bumps meals when they're too awful long. But uh, anyway, we wanted to have a, a a meeting there, and we got to pray. We got had several parts. I know Brother Junior and some of them remember that. And you know what? We had a pretty good meeting going there. It really did. God was with us. Several people saved. I remember one old elderly gentleman saved in that meeting. Had been a, on the police force in uh, Milwaukee. They'd moved that down to uh, get out of the snow up there. That's what he thought he moved for. But I think he moved. I think God moved him down to hear the gospel. But he, he was saved. He sat on four or five. Seemed like a profession. But you cannot have anything if you ignore the Holy Spirit. Because He must open up the heart. He must be life. And if He doesn't do that, you'll die just like you are. And I'm afraid we've got churches filled up with people depending on uh, depending on somebody else or something else. I was preaching a meeting in Orangeburg, Kentucky. A pretty good sized church. Very building. There was a crowd there. There, but anyway, uh, the fellow I was surprised when he called me and wanted me to come and conduct a revival meeting. And he was all enthused about it. I had a radio broadcast, so he wanted to look good. I said, Well, you know, if you don't really think I ought to come, I'll, I'll try to set a date, and I did. And I got there, and <coughs> I think, oh, maybe a month too before that, they had another evangelist. Sands claimed they had 118 saved, and, and the FBI couldn't found them. But I just go in there and preach it. But God was with me, and I could tell you, I was driving about 50 miles each way. And every night, going home, the Lord would give me the message for the next night. And all I had to do the next day was just get it done. Well, the God began to move. I remember there was a couple that left church one night and they come one there and turned around and come back. Both of them were lost. They'd been through a, somebody read them in, you know. 
Well, it wasn't long until, I mean, it, it was getting on pretty good. And suddenly the pastor, uh, he got disturbed about himself. And he'd come down every night and pray and he'd get up and he'd look and say, I know I'm sick or so-and-so, pretty well-known man, led me to the Lord. Now, I know God does use him human instrumentality, but it's the Holy Spirit that introduces you to Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah. And so we just need to stay, as Paul said to Timothy, stay with the things that you have learned and been taught that you know is right. Don't get sidetracked. And uh, So they had, a, they had a proper experience there. For our gospel came not to you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance. Oh, for a revival like that again to visit our churches and deal with people. <coughs> I don't say it bragging, but I've, God has allowed me to experience some revival meetings. As years ago, I was living in Texas. I knew the Lord wanted me to come back around Kentucky, so when I came back, some people that wanted to get an old building, an old Forest Grove school building outside of Maryland, we started a meeting there. And God began to move and bless, and there's two or three other churches that were coming all the time. And after that was over, they tried to call me at a church down there, in the community there, Francis Baptist Church. And the Lord wouldn't give me any green light to go. And so I went down and preached two or three times with a farm and had a good good time, but I couldn't get it settled in my heart that God wanted me to, to take the pastor. And they got to, they wanted to have a meeting and they wanted to know if I'd come to preach the meeting. They they called another pastor, I knew who he was. And all over that place, man, people was praying. I mean, they just might, they might be meeting in the morning or something just to that. And I got down there the first night, and I mean, that, it, it was already on. And I won't forget that night, the fellow's leading singing, and he's also, uh, I guess, about the main deacon in the church. And him and his wife and another lady used to sing for me in meetings. And so he was, I noticed during the uh, altar call or invitation, I'm not as dead or against that as a lot of people are that believe what I believe. I don't think it I don't think it takes that to get them to come, but I think sometimes it's used. I know it was on me for what I was saved. I mean, oh I tell you what he the preaching I had let me get out of the invitation and they would uh, really put it up, it bothered me. So I'm I'm not as against it as, as some are. I'm sovereign grace and you know, all the way. But I believe in the use of human instrumentality. And you see that in Philip and the Ethiopian. But any, anyway, I saw him, and we, his, his nickname was Hunky. And I saw him lay his book down in motion for somebody to come over there and uh, and take over the leading sing Another man, he come up there. And I knew uh, his boy was down there. You know? And I thought he was just going down there maybe to pray with his boy or something. And when it's over with, he go down there and trusted the Lord. And I said to him after I knew him well, I said, Hunky, how long do you know that you weren't saved? He said, at least 10 or 12 years. Pride will keep you back. It did me. Till I finally got so miserable. And I got where I didn't care what people thought. Because I was acting in church, but I didn't have any peace. Oh, that day. Oh, that day when God helped me, I said, I never get it. He, he didn't save me because I said those things and he brought me to me. I, Lord, I don't care if I'm a deacon or what I am. I just want peace. And he struck that in my heart. That's been 50 some years ago. So we need to get back to really praying and really seeking God. 
because we've got people among us that's lost. I've got I've got people in my own family that I'm really worried about. I'll be heading back to Thailand. But that will keep me praying for them. In fact, I said to one of my granddaughters, she's working in a store. She's not saved. She's heard the gospel. She's 19 years old now. She's very old. I know what it is. She loves this world so much. Devil makes this world seem so attractive. Folks, they don't have a thing to help them. I said to her, I went by where she's working there in the deli and I thought her name, she ordered it. I said, I've got one more week. She told me she's going to come see me. I want to talk to her. She knows what it is, what I'm going to do. She said, well, I'm going to come. I said, all right, this week you come and do it. But you know, I, I was, I don't know, uh, here lately my mind has been running on the awfulness of hell. Can you imagine when you lift your eyes up in hell and you know you're there forever? Mm. That's a horrible, I can't, I can't even think of it, really. I think that would be one of the worst things that you have to face. Oh yes, there'll be fire and brimstone and all that. But when you wake up, this is be for me for eternity. That's the way it's going to be. I don't understand all the work in the Lord, but I know this. If your heart has been touched, then you can put it down. You don't have to worry about election or anything else. You come to Christ. God will take care of that. Another thing I thought of, how sad it's going to be if people get left behind in some way that have knowledge of it. And they wake up and the closest people to them, their family is gone. This is serious business, folks. It's going out here and trying to pay or something for numbers <coughs> and it's not worth a dime. <coughs> I remember the time we lived in Providence, Kentucky, and my son had just gotten married. They got. I helped him get a little house down there because he was, <clears throat> they was kind of in bad shape. He he was actually up terrible, and his wife was lost. <clears throat> but she told me she was saved for the marriage. But uh, after the Lord got a hold of her, say she said, "I lied to you." So I'm going to say, I wouldn't be surprised. But anyway, that. But I remember the young people coming by down there as so other day. And they had that high on it, too. And they'd come to the door, you know, and, and uh, you know, they, their whole thing was trying to get somebody to pray a prayer. So they could put another notch on the gun. You know how long that church lasted? It never did get going. Oh, friend, we need to get out seriously. I say you here today, and I'm going to close here in a minute. Kind of ground for them. Be talking about there, but so I can see it too. I don't mind. I don't mind somebody looking at their watch, but when you hold it up and shake it, well, see if it's running. No, but seriously, I'm as serious as I can be. If you're not saved today, you're walking on thin ice. I used to hear him say, "The bread will thread of life." When he snaps it, that's it. You're in, you're in eternity. Ecclesiastes, the professor said, as a tree falls, so shall he abide. And whatever shape you die in, that's what, what that's the shape you'll have for eternity. God help us to get serious. I'm thankful that the Lord led me to a church and I was I had joined the church when I was a kid. In fact, I went by it yesterday, I think every time I do. And uh, they granted me a letter and they hadn't seen me in 12 years. I don't know what they recommended. 
But anyway, I got the church organizers lost as an Easter egg. But I still know God led me. Because that church didn't have nothing else. It had the Spirit of God in it. I used to stand in the invitation of closing songs. And the Holy Ghost would say to me, Young man, you're lost. Oh, how miserable. But thanks be unto God, God continued to work till he broke my pride and brought me face to face with the fact that I needed Jesus. And I say to you today, if you're not saved, you need Jesus. Amen. You don't need religion, you don't need this, you need Jesus. Psalms, even when I was a uh, young I remember him. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Right. Calling for you and calling for me. Used to sing an old song, Oh, why not tonight? I don't know what all of it's exactly scripture for. Why do you tarry, dear brother? And I know one thing, they used to speak to my heart. The Holy Spirit can do a lot of work in spite of us. But he can do a lot, he'll do a lot more when we're yielded to him. This morning, are, are you really saved? Do you have a place to go back to where the Lord saved you? Only you can tell about that. Because I know some of them here knew my first wife. She, she, she was a church member for 50 years. And the Lord saved her. Wonderful time. I always kind of wondered, you know, about was she really saved because her interest wasn't all that much in spiritual things. But she was depending on what somebody had told her. But God in mercy saved her about three or four years before she went to be the Lord. Oh, how gracious He is. I say to you this morning, this stand and Brother Jimmy, you come in, you know, the musician come, and this thing, stand or two, I'm not going to try to pull no tricks with you. But I would say this, if you're not saved and you know it, if I were, I, if you, I would, I, I'm seriously, I'd give attention to my soul above everything else. I was preaching up in Ohio County, the eastern end of it, several years ago, it was 40 years almost now. And we went down to see a fellow I'll never forget they wanted us to go see. Him. And uh, I knew the Lord was dealing with him, but he was wanting to be pretty tough, very big old guy. And I told him, I called his name, his name was Mendel. I said, Mendel, if I was in your place, I said, God's dealing with you. I said, I'd lay aside everything and I'd give myself to seek of the Lord and tell my family. And he come to church that night. And I never forget, I mean, he come off the church was in there's a hill going down and he, he had an old pickup truck and fenders on the county flop and he come down the hill, come out and sit down just about the back of the church. We were singing a closing hymn and then he came. And I heard him coming down the aisle, had this old church building had hardwood floors in it. And he had on cowboy boots and you could hear him every step he took. And I said, Mendel, what'd you come for? You want to be saved? He said, the Lord saved me when I left my feet back there. I said, that's good enough for me. Oh, don't don't put the Lord off. And I'm not somebody said, You sound like an Armenian, maybe we ought to be a little more like an invitation, not the theology. Father, I pray that you will bless here. I know I haven't done a good job. But I learned a long time ago it's not how good a job I do. It's whether you're pleased to work in the hearts of people. Oh, I pray today if there's some here, no doubt there are some here, that have never settled this question.
God, if you're drawing them, I pray you are drawn today to the point they'll come trusting Christ as their own, as their Savior. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.